artist, Melanie Johnson. She traveled from Kansas City to be with us tonight, where she's an associate professor of art and design at the University of Central Missouri. Melanie holds an MFA in painting from the Henry Radford Hope School of Fine Arts at Indiana University in Bloomington. In an exhibition review, a critic captured her work perfectly when he wrote, for all the darkness in Johnson's work, there is a tenderness and love. Melanie's gallery talk will be followed by a question and answer time, so please help me to welcome Melanie Johnson. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Penny, so much for the introduction, and thank you for having me. This is a beautiful space, and everything so far has been wonderful. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background, uh, but I think these things always work better you know, sort of as a conversation. So I'm going to try to leave some time um, just to kind of field questions and, and to talk to you guys about the work if you have any um, you know, kind of specific queries. Um, like Penny said, I received my MFA from Indiana University and my BFA from Missouri State University, and both of my degrees are in painting. Um, and I've always, oh, the mic's on. <laughs> I've always been interested in, in working with the figure. Um, I had a couple you know, really formative experiences as a student where as an undergraduate student and a graduate student both, I was able to spend some time uh, studying in Italy. So when I was an undergraduate student, um, mostly I was drawing big sculptures. And so I was drawing from like Michelangelo and Pisano and, um, and I was making really bad drawings. And you know, I was just, I was so frustrated that I was looking at this beautiful artwork and trying to make sense of it and everything that happened in my sketchbook um, or my drawing pad just you know, like went downhill. Uh, but I think you know, the thing that I took away from that and it took a while to, to figure out like, what I was gleaning from it was just this sense of monumentality that I was working from these big sculptures and that somehow infiltrated the work from that point on. And then, you know, like when I went back as a graduate student, I was, you know, looking at things a little bit differently. Um, I was still drawing from sculpture, but I was looking like really closely at painting, and I was looking at, you know, like a huge variety of painting from, you know, Quattrocento to, you know, Venetian painting. And I became really interested in narrative and the conceit of the picture plane and, you know, like the painting as a physical object too. And you know, those are things that started to, to really inform my work, that you know, I was grappling with all of those things and trying to construct narratives. Um, and you know, at this time, I was working you know, pretty much exclusively in paint. Like I would draw in my sketchbook, but really like what I was doing in the studio was painting. And I was making these you know, like really large scale narrative paintings. And I was interested in um, you know, these sort of complexities of intimate relationships that, you know, like those things that lie just below the surface that maybe you don't see um, unless you're really paying attention, like unless you really know someone. Um, and, you know, I was doing this and I was hiring models and, and I didn't really know the models that well. And so there was something that was falling flat that I couldn't, you know, juggle all these things. I was struggling with the paint and, and trying to get the models to, you know, sort of, you know, reenact these sort of relationships that I had in my head, but they didn't have that relationship between the two of them or the, the three of them. And so I started reverting to charcoal drawings because I could work through the drawings, you know, fairly quickly. And, and I started using myself as, you know, sort of a, a stock character, kind of thinking like, you know, I have access to myself and I could construct these relationships if I'm not thinking about like making a true self-portrait like I can see if I can get um, you know like the these kinds of like intimacies to happen and you know also these kinds of awkwardnesses um, and so you know again when I was thinking about Italian painting a lot of that had to do with touch and you know relationships between figures and these you know sort of like intimate exchanges um, that I was looking at in figures that I was looking um, you know, a lot of like visitation paintings and that sort of thing and trying to, to get at that theme. And, um, and so that's how these, like the drawings started that, you know, I was working with myself as this idea of a character and, you know, trying to work out, you know, how just to get the figures to interact and to have, 
you know, this kind of feeling. And I didn't quite know exactly what I was trying to express. Like I was, you know, like feeling around in the dark a little bit. But I think the, the earliest pieces here, um, you know, come like right out of that. So you know, like the work here is, the oldest pieces are probably like eight years old or so. And you know, like the, the couple by the door there. Um, and then as I continued to do this, I was working back and forth between you know, drawings and paintings and trying to get the drawings to inform the paintings. And then there was just a point where like the drawings took off and they became their own thing. And, and I really got interested in um, you know, like these kind of constructed narratives. Like the narratives were coming from personal experiences, but also you know, things that I was reading. So you know, poetry and that sort of thing, like I, I keep um, you know, sort of like a sketchbook notebook that, you know, like a lot of times lasts for several years and, and I'll put everything in there. Like I'll put drawings in there, but also, you know, just like passages from poetry or what I'm reading or, you know, like a lot of times like recipes get stuck in there or weird directions and, and I don't pay attention to it for a long time. And then I'll go back through and find these like kind of weird connections that, you know, there's a kind of narrative in you know, like these everyday accruals of things that, you know, some of it is like really dramatic and, you know, I think it's like really important and some of it is just like really mundane that, you know, like this is my grocery list for the day and it's just because I happen to have my sketchbook like in my bag with me. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in those kinds of connections that, um, you know, constructing a, a narrative out of these domestic situations that, you know, sometimes gets like a little bit warped or like a little bit you know, fantastical. And so, um, you know, like I, I borrow a lot sometimes from like pre-Raphaelite paintings. And it's not necessarily that, you know, like I love those paintings. It's just that the narratives are so strange. You know, I mean, you look at the image and the image, you know, like feels like it should be right. And then you look at it and, and it's not right because everything has the kind of same resolution. But then, you know, like the narrative is just as, as weird you know, that like things are, are normal, like people are sitting around a table, but there's also, you know, like a head buried in that planter kind of thing, which is like, that's not normal. And and so like I try to kind of tap into that a little bit where a lot of the, the large drawings come from like a really specific narrative, like something that happened to me, like the, the drawing over here, my son when he was six um, was convinced that he could catch a rabbit. And, and I kept telling him, no, you cannot catch a rabbit. And, um, and we had this conversation for you know, probably a month. And then he came in one night you know, after I'd gone to bed and he had a rabbit in his hands. And, and I was totally, I mean, like I was asleep. I thought that you know, like I was totally dreaming this thing. And, and he'd gone in the backyard and the dogs had cornered a rabbit and he picked it up and brought it in the house. And, and it was one of those things that it was, you know, just a specific moment in our lives. It was just, a, you know, sort of like an everyday kind of thing, but it was also this like fantastical thing for him that like he'd gone out in the middle of the night and like caught a rabbit. And, and I was totally, you know, like shocked that, and I had no idea to, what to do with this rabbit. Um, but it, it turned into a drawing where it had a sensibility, you know, like it's grounded in reality, but there's, you know, sort of like a dreamscape that happens at the same time. Um, and so, I mean, I, I kind of work back and forth where, you know, like there's a personal iconography that, that comes up. If you look closely in a lot of the large drawings, you know, there are things hidden in the corners that, um, you know, we had like a pinata in the yard and a deflated um, clown balloon. But like in the, the larger drawings, you know, with the dogs, there are little animals hidden. And like all of the animals kind of have their own place. Like they all have sort of a story behind them. Um, and it's, it's sort of a way for me to construct a narrative and to keep myself entertained. I don't necessarily need for everybody to read that iconography, but it, it does sort of have a way of, um, you know, kind of holding the, the structure of, of the drawing and, you know, constructing meaning, like, as I'm making the things. And so, um, and that's, you know, sort of important that I'm, I'm able to keep myself engaged in the process that, you know, a lot of it is, you know, the story unfolding as I'm making the piece. And I think in that way, you know, there's a, a kind of theatrical aspect there um, that, you know, like the frontality and the, the format, you know, does have, you know, like that, that sense of theater, a sense of stage. But, you know, I really enjoy, like, when I look at painting and, you know, like when I'm analyzing, you know, again, kind of that conceit of the picture plane, the way things are constructed, 
that you know, like a lot of times the way the, the painting is constructed is totally manipulated to get a story to unfold in a single image. And, and it asks the viewer to spend time with it, right? That it, it gets you there through the impact of the image, but the longer you stand in front of it, the more that read sort of unfurls and the more you see what's going on. And there's, you know, like there's a passage of time that happens there. And so, you know, like I'm, I'm really interested in trying to get that to happen, that I want to lure the viewer in through, you know, the impact of the, the light that they are, you know, like really, you know, dramatically lit. But the longer you stand there, the more you see, the more that story sort of unfolds. Um, you know, at the same time, I think like the physicality of the drawings themselves um, is important, that you can, in most of these, like you can see my hand there, like you can actually like see eraser marks. Um, a couple times, and I've been called on like the eraser shaving still being stuck on the drawing. Um, but, you know, I, I think the fact that they are sort of like made by hand and they're made over a long period of time, you know, if, if you're looking at that, then you know, like I'm part of that narrative that, um, and the same thing, it's like when I'm looking at paintings, I, I love that, you know, like there's the, the Bellini and the Frick, the, what is it, the ecstasy of like St. Francis, and in the corner, you can actually see like Bellini's thumbprint there, where, I mean, it's just, it's such a beautiful thing, it's a beautiful painting, but there's also, you know, the fact that it was like made and thought about and contemplated and, you know, like it, it took, you know, that sort of amount of time to come into being. Um, at the same time, or probably like a little bit after the large drawings, I, I went back to painting. And so, you know, I kind of work back and forth and, and I'll work, you know, sort of multiple bodies at the same time. But like I said, the, the drawings usually um, work a little bit faster than the paintings just because there's less to juggle. I mean, and it's, if anybody, you know, any of you paint, like painting is slow, um, and that's just, you know, how it works sometimes. Um, but for a couple of years, I had a, a studio residency, and I had a really large studio with high ceilings, and so I took advantage of that to start making some large paintings to see if I could get the paintings to talk to the drawings a little bit more. Um, and I'd just come back from a residency in Wales and where I was, you know, like I was looking at the space really closely and it's also, you know, like where my family is from and I became interested in sort of the, the mythology um, in that area. And um, I was also thinking about, you know, like these kind of domestic situations and, you know, inaccessibility that you can live with a person and, and not really have like access to them. And so I started making these paintings about sleep that, you know, like they're sort of like points of sleep where that dreamscape from the drawings is still there. Um, and it's maybe like a little more literal in, in the imagery that the figures are actually sleeping um, or in some sort of, you know, like dreamscape. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of catch that point where, you know, like even like this is my son and, you know, like even like I, I interact with him every day. There's a, a Sharon Olds poem called Size and Sheer Will that's, you know, about her son, like, growing up in the point that, like, you know, like, you don't know what's going on in your kid's head anymore. And, um, and so, I, like, I tried to get the, the figure to actually grow, that, you know, like, there's a distortion and an elongation in the figure and this, you know, kind of, like, spiral that happens where, you know, like, his arm is disproportionately long. Um, and this is, you know, like, a much bigger figure. He's, you know, he's bigger than I am, but, uh, but not, not this big kind of thing, um, where I was, you know, trying to get those kinds of distortions to talk about, you know, the domestic part of it, but also, you know, like these things where, you know, maybe we don't have access to somebody else's reality, or maybe, um, you know, we don't even have like a full grip on our, our own reality. Um, the smaller paintings, you know, are again, are, are more like dreamscapes, and I was trying to incorporate a little bit more of, you know, like that kind of Welsh mythology and, um, you know, how strange I found that to be, that there's a mountain in Wales where, you know, like the, the myth is that like if you're, if you sleep on the mountain, you either wake up like a poet or you go mad. And, and I just, I thought that was a strange kind of thing that, you know, all of this was, um, you know, kind of, swirling around at the same time. And so, you know, that's sort of like where the paintings are at now. And I think there's, there's always that frustration that the paintings aren't the drawings and the drawings 
aren't the paintings, but I'm I'm interested in how they talk to each other. That you know, like one thing starts to inform the other one, and you know, a lot of times if I have an idea that's working in paint, um, or that's working and I'm painting and I can't get it to um, to come to being in paint, then you know, like it, it starts to become a series of drawings. So, so that's where I'm at. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Geography over here. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Um, is that about a lady in a foreign land? No, I mean it's it's more about a, a state of separation, and so you know again like not having access to. Um, you know, those people that we're closest to. That, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's meant to be more of a, a mental state that way. Okay. Talk a little bit about uh, the want of a star object. Ah. The middle yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky image. And I, again, like the, the narrative itself is a little bit ambiguous. Um, you know, it's maybe clear in my head, it, it, like sort of a mental state that like I was trying to get a sense of, of vulnerability in the figure. And I, I think that's something that's you know, fairly pervasive in the work, that I'm really interested in the vulnerability of the figure, especially the monumental figure, um, the juxtaposition of those two. And you know, I think in, in this one, it, there's a lot of maybe personal iconography that happens in um, the plant life and that sort of thing that talks about, um, well, you know, I mean, again, just sort of vulnerability in, in physicality, like, you know, how we are in our own bodies and vulnerability to someone else and um, in trying to get those things to, to work kind of quietly. The large drawings, um, I work on doors, and so um, I don't have a, a huge studio space at home, but I have a series of doors that I line up, and I put the paper down on the doors, and I put a ground down, so I, I just I basically, like, I put a ground of charcoal on all of the um, pieces of paper, and then um, usually it starts as, like, one big movement, so I try to work, like, all of the panels together initially, and then, you know, once the drawing gets a little bit more developed, then I focus in on a single panel. And then, you know, I get to the point where I'm actually moving the paper up and down the doors so I can get in there, or I'm working on a ladder. Um, and it just depends on, you know, what my source material is. Like, a lot of times I'm constructing situations in the studio and lighting them. So, you know, like there is sort of like an element of theater. Um, and I'm using myself as a source. So, you know, like I've got a big mirror. Um, occasionally I use photo references, but I, I kind of find that with the photo references, the form falls flat and I can't manipulate it, you know, the same way that I, I can if I'm just like moving things around the studio. So, um, you know, a lot of the process has, you know, I have to take into consideration like what's happening physically. So, yeah. I, I know you, you made reference to uh, sort of a theatrical kind of approach a little bit. Mm -hmm. A, a lot of the lighting is um, is really manipulated, and a lot of it's not logical at all. So, like, I use multiple light sources and different kinds of lights. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is really removed from you know what could happen feasibly, realistically, and and I think there there is that kind of theatrical connection there that um, you know I'm manipulating the light more for the image, and you know for the drama of the narrative rather than you know any sort of naturalism. Mm-hmm.